Hey, welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it's always a privilege. Uh, today, uh, we will be talking about uh, best practices when looking at all flash storage options with vSphere. This is a community voted session. For, for, so for those of you who voted to see this, thank you. The leader of the technology component will be... My name is Cody Hosterman. I'm the technical director at Pure Storage for VMware Solutions. And I will play his comedic sidekick who no longer puts his hands on the keyboards. Uh, I am Vaughn Stewart, uh, VP of Technology at Pure Storage. Uh, we hope you find this session uh, informative. This will be a vendor neutral um, uh, session. So we'll be highlighting uh, not just uh, recommendations that we make, but recommendations and practices that go across the industry. Uh, we have more content that we can deliver in an hour. So this is going to be a little bit of speed tech, you know, sharing with you. Uh, but with that, uh, there are a couple mics up front, and for those of you who thought we might be having a karaoke contest, while we welcome karaoke, uh, we will take your questions. So um, we'll try to see if there's some time at the end. Uh, we'll see. If not, we'll be here after. We'll be in the hallway. We'll also be at the Pure Storage booth. So again, our goal, to not be vendor biased, to be very neutral. So with that, let's Unless, you unless, um, if you guys don't want to talk about this, I'd be happy to talk about Game of Thrones, because um, I have a lot to say right now. <laughs> but other than that, we can... Show of hands, all right. Show of hands, Game of Thrones. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh. I really wanted us to have like our vendor party wait, wait, to be a wait. Game of Thrones viewing thing, but. Wait a minute. <laughs> what did you do last night? I watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> all right, all right, let's go. All right. You want to give them our philosophy? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, a lot of best practice when it comes to AFAs with VMware, it's really a lot about understanding what things you don't need to change anymore or, or tweak or tune. Right, a lot of the performance management tools and things like that and features are built around the concept of spinning disk, right? And so having additional performance, larger queues available for these volumes and so forth does change um, some of the considerations. There are some new things that you need to consider that you maybe didn't before, and we're certainly going to talk about that. Uh, hint, hint, on map, right? Um, but there are things around queue depth limits and DSNRO and whatnot that probably don't really need to consider anymore, which is... Um, this is something where I do kind of differ from some of the other vendor recommends. I don't think you need to change these values, but I'm going to spend a, some time explaining why, right? So I think the important thing is at least understand these settings. You guys can make your own decision yeah. on, on how you set it up. But yeah, um, and, I, and I think the key so why is the important part, I think, right? That's the key phrase, right? Yeah. So you want me to jump here? You yeah, want you can okay. take it. Go for it. So just some basic recommendations, and this kind of follows sessions that we have delivered uh, in, in this space in the past, which is in, understand that VMware has a large partner ecosystem when it comes to storage. And the documents that they publish may or may not align with what your storage vendor or other storage platform, you know, uh, technology partner may provide for you. So you need to understand this, that VMware's doc uh, documentation and guidelines are always general recommendations, what works best across a broad ecosystem of disk, hybrid, all flash architectures, okay? When it comes to your specific implementation, you should be looking at your storage vendor's um, guidance for any specifics or when there's a question between do I use the VMware setting or the vendor setting. The vendor setting will be tested, validated, and ultimately supported if they're uh, going against the grain or expanding what VMware's stating as supported or as a traditional uh, uh, setting in the long run. At the end of the day, we share a philosophy, a long health philosophy, which simplicity is the goal, right? By a show of hands here, how many of you manage both v VMware and storage? Okay, nice. uh, hands down. So how many manage storage only? Okay, so good. So we're in line here because we are trying to work with um, the, the storage industry as a whole, which is really converging the operations of storage and compute together. And simplicity is the goal here to allow people who are not storage experts to become successful at managing storage at large scale. So you'll see common themes from us, which is like, Use large data stores or virtual volumes when you can. Um, you know, really limit the use of RDMs. It's time to start transitioning those to VVOLs if your storage infrastructure supports it. And avoid a basic thing that we're not going to go into here, but, you know, by and large, avoid jumbo frames for iSCSI and NFS. You, you know, what we see by and large is very inconsistent performance gains, but what you're trading off is complexity in the networking layer. And should you, by chance, happen to have a frame size mismatch, you will now have a storage problem that has nothing to do with your array. Also very difficult to troubleshoot. So with this, I'm going to jump in. Oh, you're, you're, you're going right. to jump nope, in. Nope, I'm ahead. You're All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about a little bit about performance <clears throat> basics, okay? And we're not going to go into, am I going the right way? 
We're not going into storage I.O. systems. We're not going anything about, you know, what's the, the how to benchmark flash, anything along those lines, right? We're skipping all those basics. We're going to talk about vSphere. So let's start with, with multipathing. Regardless of the array that you are looking at today within the all flash space, the large guidance is that you need to look at round robin multipathing. Right, you want to set your devices to use this, and some of the devices are going to automatically configure because they've got configuration files with inside of vSphere that help identify the array and set the vendor preferred multipathing policy. Some of the arrays don't have those settings by default. For example, Pure Storage has been in that position for a little while. That changes with? Yeah, and uh, 6.5 update one, we have default rules, or 6.0 okay. patch five. Yeah. So make sure that you, you, you're setting, if your array is not being detected for its specific make and model, within vSphere that you will want to go ahead and start by first setting multipathing to round robin. You're going to be able to maximize the performance by leveraging IO going out all the paths available to your host. Um, most most FA, AFAs are claimed by the uh, Alua policy, which defaults to round robin. I mean, sorry, most recently used. So that's generally why you want to make this change. Yeah, so when we look at, when we look at, um, yeah, so when we look at just to, to, to level set here, most recently used is going to put all of your I.O. onto a single path. And your I.O. will stay on that path until such a time that you have a path failure. And then, it, then your host will then use another single path. And again, all the data will remain on that path until there's a failure and a requirement to move back. Um, so most re recently used is a little more advanced than fixed, which is a static single path. Again, you want to use round robin. You want it to be a dynamic allocation of I.O. up and down that path. Once you've set for round robin, now you have to look at your I.O. operations limit. And the default I.O. operations limit is 1,000 I.O. per path before the secondary path is used in a round robin scenario. This has been a topic that has been discussed for probably a half a dozen years as, as we've been looking at it in the storage space. But what we have learned in testing and validation and now customer deployments is there is actually an advantage to start to set the, the I.O. Per, um, per path limit down from the default 1,000 down to one. And the reason for this, in some cases, could be performance, but that's not the metric that we want to look at. We think there's going to be some variability based on your array, and we don't want to speak for your vendor. However, what we can validate, because it doesn't have anything to do with your array, but does have to do with the multipathing stack inside of vSphere, is it will impact your failover time when you have a control, controller failover, whether it's planned, say, as a software update, or whether it's unplanned, say, a performance, I'm sorry, a failure or a bug. Yeah, and I mean, so I think the only one that doesn't choose one, I believe SolidFire recommends five. Um, and the main reason for that, for my talk, my discussions with SolidFire people, um, was that they, there is a little bit of a CPU overhead, changing it lower and lower. Granted, most environments are memory bound, not CPU, so that overhead is generally small, but that, that is the recommendation, my understanding. Um, but the rest of them is generally one. Uh, so the path, if path fail over time is more important to you, um, then setting it to one is probably the option. If you're really, really concerned about CPU, then maybe up it a little bit, 520 or something like that, you'll be okay. Yeah, and, and, and later on, we'll start talking about efficiencies, and I'll come back around to CPU and memory usage. So remember here, if setting this policy may drive your CPU utilization up a little bit higher. We're gonna show you why that's not a non-issue in, in a little bit later in this session. So real quick, you want to look at your best option, you know, setting a SATP rule. Uh, you know, always set the, the rule first, right, prior to the provisioning any storage to the ESX host. That way all the new paths that are deployed will, will apply to that rule. SATP is not retroactive. It doesn't go and change any of the existing paths. Uh, you can do this versus SSH, Power CLI, or host profiles. Very straightforward, lots of options depending on whether you'd like to take an API first or a GUI-driven type of management approach. So common questions that we typically get from customers when we look at VMFS, because it's still a predominant deployment model today, right? Large shared data stores, which is, you know, what size should I look at? Is there a limit? Is there performance constraints I need to look at? What about the number of data stores? Is it better to have fewer versus, versus, um, uh, versus more? Should I have more storage volumes underneath the, in an individual data store, et cetera? And, and what's my, my virtual machine to data store density ratio? And really, we don't have any requirements now that you start to get into the all-flash array. Most modern all-flash arrays start to have global queues, so you don't have to worry about you know, per queue, per path, per, per volume, which is something you used to have to deal with with uh, disk-based storage arrays in the past. Uh, what you really need to start to consider, though, is um, a few things like the following. First is 
you should always be leveraging VAAI enhancements in your storage, right? The number one inhibitor to, to VMFS scaling in the past was SCSI reservations and file locks. Uh, that's why the whole NFS market kind of took off, and if you were an NFS customer, I'm a culprit in that space. But that issue got resolved around 2010 with v, uh, ESX 4.1 and has continued to enhance as we've gone through the v VMware uh, ESXi versions. So I don't have to worry about SCSI locks becoming a bottleneck within the infrastructure. Um, second, the hardware-assisted locking or the atomic test and set, right, is the underpinning technology in this space and allows us to only lock the metadata as needed versus locking the entire file system as we have to do a metadata update or change, right? And it allows um, simultaneous access to I.O., right? Again, we don't get caught up in the whole data store being locked because of a metadata update or change. And I, there's, you know, one of the concerns with ATS that been out there, right, was around um, ATS heartbeating on data stores, right, where you could accidentally get a miscompare. Um, and they basically, ESX would just tear down the storage stack, which is not a great thing, right? Um, so that issue with the miscompares has been fixed in 6.5. VMware has fixed it in a couple different ways. So that kind of remaining catch that some people had when using ATS um, around heart beating should be gone in 6.5. And why do I believe that these are your sections? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't in the session earlier. We'll keep going. It's enough. No, Go no, you, you keep going, because I feel like I'm I'll talk all day if you let me, so don't, 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 don't even get me started. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So, um, Q depths. Right. This is this is a common question that I get um, around VMware ESX, right, and of course the the flash array. And I actually do have a longer session Wednesday going into the details on Q depths and all that stuff. But it's important to talk about in this, right, because it is a question that comes up. And and one of the concerns out there is that in my best practice documentation for Pure, um, I tell people don't bother changing it, right, and that does differ. Um, from some of the AFA. So once again, obviously talk to your vendor, consider the ins and outs, but what I'm gonna try to do here is just give a real quick overview on how the queuing works and why it may not matter in your environment, at least from defaults. So the first question is what is a queue? What is a queue depth limit, right? It's basically how wide your, your lanes are, right? Uh, the common uh, example I give is like, you know, the grocery store, right? If you have one register, you can service one customer at a time. So your queue depth limit is one. Right? If you have two registers, you can service two people at a time. Right? Your QDEP limit is two. Right? So more people, more outstanding IOs, more concurrent IOs can be handled at once right? when your QDEP limit is higher, therefore allowing you to get higher levels of performance when we're talking about throughput in IOPS. Right? So <clears throat> from an array perspective, the, conceptually it's no different. Right? Um, how many you can process at once to a VMFS data store or a raw device map is called an outstanding I.O. or uh, concurrent threads or um, basic in-flight I.O.s, I.O.s that are being processed beyond that layer. Right? If there's a limit at that layer, only so many can be processed and then they're gonna start waiting. Right? So generally inside of VMware, the QDEP limit is gonna resolve itself to be around 32, meaning that the default configuration for your standard VMware environment is gonna be, hey, I can, have, I can handle 32 outstanding IOs for this data store on this host at once. So the question is, is that number good for you? Should it be changed, or should it be lowered, should it be higher, should it be dynamic, I don't know, right? So the first thing you need to understand is there are different Q depth limits. And now I'm not gonna get into um, like buffer credits and switches and things like that because that's kind of a different conversation. Generally these are the ones that are really are important in most environments. There's your storage array Q depth limit. There's your HBA device queue depth limit. Right? And then there's also a virtual SCSI adapter queue depth limit. So your, your para-virtual, your LSI logic you have in that virtual machine, how many IOs that they can have outstanding against that adapter in that VM. And your individual virtual disk also have their own queue depth limit. How many IOs can be currently in flight against this particular VMDK? Right? So there are limits, and there are limits at different places. So it's somewhat important to understand where these are. The number one thing to understand about ESX is that it's designed by default for some level of fairness. Right? VMware just like architecturally, right, the whole concept is shared resources, right? I have multiple VMs, I have multiple data stores. I don't wanna give anyone everything, right, out of the box. I probably, most all of you have experienced a situation where you've taken a physical server, did a, you know, used the VM converter or whatever, right, or rebuilt it inside of ESX, same memory, same CPU, but it didn't give the same performance from a storage perspective. Right? This is because of this. VMware does artificially lower what can, each VM can do automatically because they want to provide some fairness. Right. So the first thing you really need to consider about this is your array. 
what is the Q-depth limit? Most AFAs out there don't necessarily have Q-depth limits on their volumes or even their targets, right? A single volume, at least from the flash rate perspective, can offer the full performance of, of the array, and that's not an uncommon thing across the AFAs, I believe, right? But this is the important thing to understand, right? Because if you do have a per volume or per target Q-depth limit, generally that's probably the problem you're gonna have to work around and solve. And that's often solved by concurrency, more, more than one VMFS volume, right, for a certain workload or something like that. Yeah, and, and just to restate, that, that's a question to ask your AFA vendor. Most have a global queue, some have a per volume or per controller queue. So it's, a, it's certainly a conversation you want to have, and that's the first thing you want to think about, right? Once you've passed that, then it's time to kind of move to the VMware layer. So the first setting here is going to be your HBA, HBA Q depth limit, right? And this is hard-coded into the HBA, but it can be changed, right? But it's usually a host reboot. That's why I mean hard-coded. And depending on your vendor, this number is a little bit different. QLogic's a little bit higher. Uh, Software iSCSI is the highest. Everyone else is kind of around 32. If you have one VM on a, VM, on a ESX server on that data store or accessing that RDM, this is the value that's going to matter. This is going to be your current effective QDEP limit for that volume. Now, DSNRO is the next question around this. And this, this sometimes gets a little confusing because it is a little bit confusing. DSNRO, called Disk Schedule Number Request Outstanding, um, is actually an option that doesn't exist anymore. It's just what everyone refers to it as. Um, this used to be a host-wide setting um, on your ESX server and that all of your, all your VMFS data stores or RDMs would get this. And essentially, it's a hypervisor level QDEP. If you have more than one active VM on that data store on that host, the minimum of this value in your HBA Q depth limit is going to be what your actual Q depth limit is. All right, so if these are set differently, you, you could go in ESX top and you'll actually see the number go up and down and up and down and up and down. Right? Because maybe, hey, one VM's inactive, one is now, one's not, this data store moved, VM moved, right? Um, so that's an important thing to note the difference between these. DSNRO it, in 6.0 and earlier can be set up to 256. That's the maximum. In 6.5, they've changed this. It can now be set up to whatever the HBA device Q depth limit is. So if your HBA Q depth limit is five, well, that's the maximum a DSNRO can be, right? If it's 2,000, we can set it to 2,000, right? So this change in 6.5 makes a lot of sense. In, so in um, 6.0 and later, or rather 5.5, I think, update three or something, um, this is a per data store setting, and it's kind of referred to as number of outstanding IOs with competing worlds. DSNRO is just a little easier to say, so that's what I refer to it as. Um, but this is the hypervisor level QDEP limit, right? So in the end, your effective QDEP is going to be the minimum of these two if you have more than one VM on that host. So generally, the guidance is if you're going to change them, you probably want to make them the same. In 6.5, they help you make sure that's true, um, but it's a general guidance around that. So we'll get into what that number should be or what that means in a bit, but first let's talk a little bit more about the rest of the stack. So inside of your guests, there's a virtual SCSI adapter, right? Generally defaults to LSI logic. There's a few others. Para virtual is across the board. All vendors recommend this for best performance. It right. also has the lowest CPU re requirements for the I.O. stack. That's one of the most important things is that if you have, high, now if you're just spitting out like 150 IOPS, you're not going to see a difference, right? But if you're pushing a workload that deserves PV SCSI, you're going to see a CPU difference on your ASX server, right? It's more efficient, right, in general. But it also has, you know, Come back to QDEP limits, higher QDEP limits. By default, you can push up to 64 outstanding IOs to a given virtual disk and 256 to the whole SCSI adapter. And all those, both of those values can be quadrupled, which is much higher than LSI can do. All right, so if you need to push a lot of concurrency to a VMDK, a lot of outstanding IOs at once, right, pair of virtuals plus, plus some tweaks need to be changed. These tweaks are not an ESX level setting. They are done in the guest, right, to make it 64 or 256 or whatever number you're looking at. So, simply switching to PV SCSI is not going to improve your performance. This, this is an escalation I see a lot. Hey, you said best practices, para virtual, why am I not seeing any difference? Well, the thing to remember, right, is the device QDEP limit below that, the layer below it, has a limit of 32. So if you set PV SCSI to 256, yeah, you can send out of that VM 256 IOs at once. They're just going to wait at that data store level because the data store says, hey, I can only send 32 at once, so the other ones 
have to wait, right? So simply switching to that is not really gonna help you. So let's quickly talk about finding out how I should, if I should switch, right? So there's a value in ESX top called DQLEN, disk queue length, right? This says what your current effective disk queue length is for that, that RDM or that VMFS. Right, so doing the math between DSNRO and HPAQ depth limit, that's what it actually is. Then there's also active. This is how many outstanding IOs are currently being sent against that data store, right? In this example, I have 32, so I've, my Q depth limit is maxed out. Queued is how many are now waiting inside of that ESX server for that data store. These are waiting, therefore incurring latency, right? Adding. Since they're waiting for, to get through that queue, they are adding latency, adding time, right? Hurting your performance. Now maybe you want that, right? Maybe you don't want those, you don't want some VM to go crazy and overwhelm everyone else. Yeah, wait in the hypervisor. Right? But if you see a non-zero value in queued, you have queuing, right? So should I change them with my AFA? In general, my recommendation is no. One of the reasons is, it's just like, hey, why change something if you're not having a problem? Don't, broke what's, don't break what's not, right, don't fix what's not broken. There we go. Um, but I think there's also some math behind this. So this goes down to what, what's referred to as Little's Law. And this is one of the things I wish I was born like 100 years ago and I could create some really basic math and name it after myself. Um, but essentially what this is, is saying if it takes you so long to do something, in X amount of time, this is how many times you can do it, right? If I can, if it takes me one minute to pick up a rock, I can pick up 60 rocks in an hour, right? 60 rocks being my IOPS, right? I, instead of an S, it's an H, right? And so using our grocery store analogy, if a customer takes one minute to go through the register and you have one register, you can do 60 customers an hour, right? If you have two registers, well, your, your maximum queue is double that and you can do 120 customers in an hour. Right? So if you know how long it takes to do something and how many threads you're pushing, you can calculate your IOPS or whichever of those values you have. So now let's look at this from a storage perspective. One second is 1,000 milliseconds. Right? Let's say my average latency on my AFA is half a millisecond. Right? Therefore, with one outstanding IOs, I can do 2,000 IOs in a second, 2,000 IOPS. So the limit of VMware, right, is 32 outstanding IOs. So running that math with a half millisecond latency on average, I can do 64,000 IOPS per host, per data store at default settings. Um, out of curiosity, how many people on average are doing that? So, hence, well, that's about right. a few, use a few and that's usually what it is. Those people are the ones who probably wanna change it. But in general, you don't need to change this. Every time you make a setting and you open a case with VMware, they're gonna say, hey, why'd you change DSNR or why'd you change this, right? And you're like, I don't know, it goes. It's a larger number, right? No, I would generally not change it unless you really need that kind of performance. Now granted, if your latency is super, super high, then that Q is worth less, worth less, right? Because every IO takes so much longer and you can do less IOPS. This is why traditionally you had to do so many data stores, right? Because the, the arrays had per volume Q depth limits and therefore you had to parallelize from the, the array perspective. The AFAs, you don't really need to do this, right? So you can push this kind of performance. So do I need to change it? Depends, usually not. If you think you're gonna be on that kind of performance, right, then yeah, you probably wanna increase it. In general though, most workloads are distributed across your hosts, across your even data stores, right? Every host you add to that data store can then do another 64,000 IOPS. And I said, with AFAs, because they can empty, eight, empty out that queue depth so quickly, you can push a lot of throughput, or a lot of IOPS with default settings. All right, <clears throat> so vSphere performance features, let's quickly talk about this before I hand it back to Vaughn. One of the things that AFAs offer is sub-millisecond latency, and often sub-millisecond latency through failure. All right, here's a, just a, some analyst report or something about an AFA and their you know, flash array or whatever, pushing a bunch of performance, they you know, pulled a controller, they pulled SSDs, they took out one of the NVRAM, basically lobotomizing the thing, right? And yeah, there's some spikes, right? It's gonna go up a little bit, heals itself, back down to the sub-millisecond. But generally, you're gonna see sub-millisecond latency. So what does that mean for vSphere's performance features? So there's two main ones, right? Storage I.O. control um, and storage DRS. Storage I.O. control, basically, if a 
data store hits a certain latency threshold, it's going to start throttling the VMs on it according to the shares you've allocated to those virtual machines. The minimum setting for latency is five milliseconds. That being said, the latency that it looks at does not include queuing. So this is only looking at the latency from the time it takes the array to serve the data, read it or write it or whatever and return it back to ESX. So if you have queuing and the latency is being added, SIOC has no idea about it. Right? So what this means is that for SIOC to kick in, you need to have some pretty big time latency on your AFA, right? So SIOC may not be super useful on AFA unless you're really, really pushing it super hard. Yeah, and, and let's put this in perspective. Speaking from Pure, and I can't speak on behalf of the other vendors, our customers open support cases when the latency is above one. I would imagine that's probably the same whether you're running on EMC or Hewlett Packard or NetApp, et cetera. So my bottom line of this is you probably have already opened a support call before this is kicking in. Yeah, and the point is, right, is that you want to turn it on, sure, go ahead, right? But understand kind of what, what latency it's looking at and really what that means. So then storage DRS, what about that? Storage DRS, when a data store hits a certain level, it's going to move your VMs to another data store. Right. On a array that doesn't have per volume queue depth limits, um, moving it from one data store to another one is probably not going to help you, right? Because if it's bad on that one, it's, maybe it's bad on all of them, right? Um, now, I won't get into array-based QoS, but, you know, it's kind of standard configurations, right? But its minimum is also five milliseconds. So does that also make it useless? The answer is no. Storage DRS does not use the same latency counter that SIOC uses. Storage DRS uses what they call VM observed latency. This includes the time it's waiting in the ESX kernel. So if you have host based queuing, storage DRS can actually help you, right? Hey, this, this data store's queue depth is filled. I'm getting latency. I'm going to throw it over. Right? Now, granted, getting five milliseconds of queue latency actually is a pretty solid amount. There's probably something else going on. Uh, but it conceivably could help you. And I actually have seen some customers have some success around using this um, because they had low queues and it could balance them around, right? So that can be useful. Um, vSphere IOPS limits, right? This is a way to set like um, per VM decay and, um, or per VM IOPS limits uh, to your VMs. It says 500, this says 1,000 and so forth, right? Uh, and of course, there's also array-based QoS as well, right? There's, there's a lot of uh, good implementations out there around controlling it. In the end, though, decide where you want the latency to be controlled, where you want the crazy workloads to be controlled, whether at the array level with array-based QoS, right, at the VM level by keeping the VM pair of virtuals down or something like that, or at the data store level, right? Because if you open up one of these queues, anyone below that level can then be affected by everyone that's above it, right? So conceptually, probably shouldn't have to generally change most of these. Looks like that's most people in this room. But I think it's important to understand how this works. And I said I go into a lot more detail, which might, maybe that sounds boring. I don't know, it's uh, on Wednesday, but, you know, F FYI. All right, go on. First off, I want to apologize for starting this session off and starting to, to, to go through Cody's talk track. I'm, I'm sitting there looking at the slides going, I've looked at these slides, but I'm just not sure that these are what we walked through. So um, thank you for being so courteous, but you should have just stood up and said, shut up. <laughs> My stuff. So I want to talk a little bit to you about, uh, about I.O. and latency and come back to the, the notion where Cody's talked about if we change the number of I.O.s that we put down a, down a path, it's going to increase our CPU a little bit, right? Also kind of talk about things where, where we talked about pair virtualization uh, is going to uh, help reduce your, your uh, uh, CPU load per I.O. But I actually want to get into a little bit of a myth, myth busting, if you will. Uh, I would share with you probably that the most common question that, that I incur, and I don't know if Cody comes across the same question, around all flash storage is customers say, look, I, my, the majority of my VMs are tier two. You know, maybe I've got a hundred tier one, but I've got a thousand tier two VMs or something along that line, right? And so I don't know that I need the performance of an all flash array for my tier two. And that's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, uh, we'll talk about uh, efficiency as a whole here, and we'll start in this area. Um, what you need to understand is that storage I.O. is exponentially slower than the rate that a CPU can process data. 
And so while we're all, you know, used to someone saying, look, I, I moved a, a, a high demanding or high performance application, let's say like a transactional database workload, be it SQL or Oracle, and they move it on all flash array and everything's faster. Like we get that, we grok that. But you have to take a step back and understand what's making it faster and how does that apply to a non-demanding workload? Basically what you're seeing is that Flash allows the IO uh, to be retrieved from storage, processed through data, returned to storage, exited from the hypervisor memory, right, in a shorter amount of time. That's why when you don't change anything but you change the storage out, the performance centric application gets faster because you're, com you're reducing the time that it takes to complete an IO operation, thus in a set amount of time, I can do more IO. It also means the inverse, which is when I've got my tier two VMs and they're not performance centric. It means I can complete the IOs and the release of the buffered memory for each IO faster. Meaning when you move to an all flash array for your tier two workloads, you can store more virtual machines per core or per server, however you wanna measure this, than you can with slower storage. Now, we haven't done the work on our side to try to help you understand how to identify this through VROPs. We have engaged some others to look at this. And basically when you suggest that someone may need fewer um, you know, software licenses, you, know, you get mixed results on the amount of people who wanna come help you out. But I can share with you that this is a, a, an effect that is observed firsthand um, across our customer base and when I talk to my peers and the other storage vendors, they see the same thing. So again, if you're looking to say, I'm not sure all flash, maybe just for my most mission critical workloads, the reason why part of all flash plays for tier two is that you can, get, you can increase your density and look at cost savings uh, in that manner. Building on efficiencies, I wanna to pivot to storage efficiencies and reduce the cost of, of uh, storage per VM. I'm just tracking our time versus slides, okay. Um, I'm gonna pause here or, or explain here a little, a little bit of, of three common constructs in the data reduction space. Deduplication, compression, and thin provisioning. And if you, some of you may go, oh, I know this technology. Bear with me before you pass judgment on the slide. We open the session saying, we wanna to explain to you what you need to worry about, what you not, don't need to worry about, and more importantly, why, okay? So I wanna break down because storage efficiency technologies are not the same per implementation, are not the same across the board. And so I wanna give you some points that you can use. I'm not gonna give you a right or wrong, but I am gonna guide you in some areas. So when it comes to deduplication, if your vendor does inline, background, both, at the end of the day, the results are gonna be nominal, right? Am I saving it when it comes in or am I saving it later on in the capacity tier? Usually by and large has no effect. Um, really, the only difference between if your vendor is inline centric or background centric or both, is really around, you know, how was the architecture designed with data reduction technologies in mind? Is it kind of, you know, na native to the, to the platform or was it added on later? And really the bottom line is, does it impact performance? That's deduplication, okay? When it comes to compression, every vendor's inline technology is lightweight. We'll give you modest savings. We'll give you modest results. We all do it because there is a direct correlation outside of the algorithm, the type of algorithm, and the format of data, there is a direct correlation between the amount of CPU that we put towards com the compression algorithm and the, the, how aggressively that data can be reduced, right? We all throttle back on this so that we can ensure performance on the front end, okay? And then thin provisioning. Uh, thin provisioning has always been, in my opinion, a half-baked solution until uh, recent years because it allowed you to start off thin, not having to allocate all the storage that you needed, but virtual machines all grew in capacity over time and they could not shrink, right? When I, uh, I've been a pure storage, almost, almost hitting my four year anniversary here, about to start my fifth year. Uh, prior to that, I spent 13 years at NetApp. We did a study back when I was in NetApp that we shared at an older VM world that's online. Uh, they basically found that roughly half of the data in your virtual machines in your VSI environment is comprised of data that is deleted, but the file system still holds on to it. That's what I mean by when I say thin provisioning has always been kind of half-baked. It's thin to begin with, but you get fat over time.
Okay? So, what matters in deduplication? What matters isn't inline or background. It really matters in kind of two areas. Are you doing it on a global basis or are you doing it on a per volume or per disk group basis? And the bottom line here is not to say like, hey, I, I have it across the whole array. It's saying, am I making sure that I only have one copy of a block that's being deduplicated across the whole footprint? Or do I have multiple copies because I have multiple volumes or multiple disk groups? Right, I can have the same reduction ratio on each volume relative to a global, but I still have, you know, if I have three volumes, I still have three independent copies of that data. So, right, I'm now at, at a three to one delta or difference. So don't always go by the ratios, right? You have to look at what is my raw capacity and what am I utilizing. Um, and, and the bottom line here is global is typically better than, than, than a per volume. And you can see weird behaviors like intervolume X copies, right? Like I'm making copies, clones in one volume, it's costing me nothing. All of a sudden I gotta make one into another volume or data store and all of a sudden, boom, my storage footprint expands because I have per volume type of boundaries. And the second is just granularity of block size. And it's a real quick rule of thumb here. Smaller is better, that's all. The more precise you can be at finding matches, the more, more matches you can take out of, the, out of the storage subsystem. On compression, what really matters is, is single versus multiple algorithms. Whether they're both inline, whether they're inline and background, whether, you know, whatever the mix is. Again, the more options that you have here, the more types of data you can, you can have reduction on. Right, an LZ in, uh, encoding algorithm re responds to data differently, or data responds to that differently than Huffman encoding. There's different formats that are more applicable to one or the other, things of that nature. That's what you need to consider. Um, so in compression, we're all same on inline. The more that your vendor offers, the better you'll be down the road. And then when it comes to thin provisioning, and we're gonna expand on this in a moment, what really matters is don't think of thin provisioning as a, as a protocol, think of it as a suite of functions. So the first thing you need to do is, does your storage array allow you to override when the host or the application is forcing thick provisioning, right? You see that in th technologies like zero removal and pattern removal, right? So think about it, an eager zero thick virtual disk has been pre-formatted with zeros, right? You want your array to get rid of those. Uh, you get an Oracle and ASM, right? And the volume manager there is gonna put patterns in that to force a thick provisioning, right? You want, you want your storage device to remove that for you to keep everything thin coming in on ingest. Um, the second element there is does your array support unmap and more specifically, and we're gonna go into this in a moment, what I call VM file system unmap. There's a lot of, Cody calls it guest OS pass through. I don't think there's a standard name, so. Um, but basically, going back to that point I made, which is roughly 50% of your data sits in virtual disks, or deleted data sits in virtual disks, I wanna get rid of that, right? So how does, does your infrastructure support that? And you're gonna see here, um, it's a combination of operating system, vSphere release, and storage protocol, okay? So let's look at this. Bottom line, it's a suite. Bottom line is more technologies are better. That's really what you wanna look at. So let's dive into the whole premise I had here that your storage is storing deleted data and it's costing you money. It's costing your firm money. The size of the array that you are looking for, whatever storage platform you're looking for, you're looking at your current VMs and going, I need X terabytes or X petabytes. What if you're buying twice as much as what you need, right? So it works like this. So uh, dead space accumulates in two phases. It accumulates in your data store Right, so like with Coney was talking about DRS, if I storage vMotion in a virtual machine, VMFS is still holding a copy, the original data store is holding a copy of the old virtual machine and that v, uh, virtual disk and the home directory, et cetera. It also lives in the file system, be it NTFS or ext 3 of the virtual machine. So if you look at it from this notion, uh, oops, there was a little bit of animation here. All right, as I'm writing virtual machines on VMFS, right, I'm writing the virtual machine in the green bar, the VMS volume is, is the orange bars that are filling up, and the array usage is the, is the dark gray or black bar at the bottom. You know, as I delete a VM from the data store, right, you don't see it in the VMFS volume, but it does still sit on the array, okay? That's kind of the basic element that we've all known about, about vSphere and, and kind of data store level on map. When we delete, it, uh, Oops, there was, a, there was a weird text there that happened, okay. I wanna talk about um, 
kind of a little bit of the background and history of, of as we look at ESXi 5.5 and 6.0 and the manual unmap of VMFS data stores, how many of you have done this? How many of you have ran an unmap command or done an S delete? Yeah, so roughly for those of you not looking backwards, it's been about a half or maybe 60% of the room kind of raise their hands like, yeah, we've done some of this notion to try to free up space. Do leading data inside of the data stores tends to give you some return, some results. Usually what I hear from customers is it's usually 10, 15%. What you don't realize is that's usually a byproduct of you doing things like DRS. You're trying to load balance for performance on disk-based arrays, right? You're cleaning up the after effect of the, the uh, hypervisor and the storage layer, just trying to, you know, do things like, you know, share resources between VMs. Uh, and you know, and, then, and, and those who have done this, it's been a manual process, right? You could script it, but it's still manual. I'm making SSH, SSH calls or power CLI calls, right? Or maybe it's in a vendor's web plugin um, to get this done. Oops, I think I covered this all here. Oops, it just it's a timing on this, sorry yeah. about this. What I wanna share with you from a data store level is that ESXi 6.5 now reintroduces the feature of data store automatic unmap. Now, there was a slide in here that I took out here which showed what, how e the, the unmap at a data store level had progressed through all the versions of, of vSphere. Uh, for sake of time, I took that out, but this is a reintroduction of a technology that was introduced, was it 5.1? 5.0. 5.0. <clears throat> and 5.1 and 5.5 and 6.0. That the long story short was, the automatic unmap feature became a challenge for disk-based arrays. You could flood the arrays with I.O. requests and basically unmap was looked at as very similar to like an I.O. storm and was problematic. As you get into this with an all-flash array, uh, these devices are better able to handle uh, this uh, enablement. And again, because most environments are aged, when you first upgrade to vSphere 6.5, you can expect a little bit of an, what I'd call an unmap storm as vSphere recognizes like, hey, now I have this capability, let me get rid of this, this data, right? It doesn't do a nice trickled out, you know, um, update for you. It just kind of recognizes that there's data that's been deleted and immediately goes and processes it. And this was what usually caught most customers by surprise and why it was a challenge historically. As Cody noted here in the bottom bullet, if you have a large environment, this could be 12 hours or more in terms of a process that kicks off at the beginning where you've got this raised level of, of um, I.O. load on your array. So as you migrate from disk stores to flash, all flash arrays and you're, you're going to do a, a 6.5 upgrade, right, you may want to just plan for this appropriately. Yeah, the main point, right, is that <clears throat> moving to 6.5 really is a good best practice for, for, for AFAs because it automates unmap and you don't need to worry about it anymore. It's an asynchronous process. So ESX hosts kind of coordinate with one another, they reclaim it over time, so you don't need to worry about running it manually or scheduling it or whatever, right? It's just a problem that takes care of itself um, over time. Now this is data stores. Now I put in parentheses here at the top, right? This also occurs in vVols, but I'm not gonna go into vVols, that'll be something Cody's gonna pick up here in, in, in a moment. Uh, what I do wanna share with you though is uh, what I'm calling uh, VM file system on map. This is getting rid of the data that's locked into NTFS um, <clears throat> and uh, for, uh, NTFS on your Windows systems, EXT uh, on your, your Linux systems. So vSphere can automatically unmap or reclaim this space, and, and unmap is a technical term, reclap is more of a conventional term, right? But you need to, you need to be on uh, vSphere 6 at a minimum for this to work, but really the recommendation is 6.5 update one, because what we have found as vSphere has been bringing this to market is we found bugs along the way that prevent customers from, you know, uh, actually, you know, they go through all the steps to turn this on, and they're like, hey, why is it not working, right? So the first value that you need to take is, is this configuration setting here uh, inside of vSphere, which is vmfs enable block delete and turn that value to one to enable it. No, that is not needed. If you're using vmfs6, that value is no longer needed. It's only for vmfs, I know it says vmfs3, it's a whole thing, I don't want to get into it, but it's only for vmfs5. If you're on 6.5 and using VMFS 6, that value doesn't do anything anymore. Oh. There's technically a bug in 6.50 and they fixed it in 6.1, but, or 6.5 update one, but that's a whole other thing. Thank you. Um, but yeah, VMFS 6, Thanks. you don't need this anymore. The next thing that you need to have is you've got to make sure, uh, so we said, right, uh, 6.0 uh, is, is vSphere version, VMFS 5 with the setting, but you've got to have your VM hardware version set to 11. Your virtual disks need to be thin. Um, and of course, enable block delete. 
So again, as you adopt new storage technology, we're gonna make a recommendation, both of us here, that you adopt thin, and we'll explain that in a moment. So we'll get to the why. But let's walk you through this example again. So I've got my array at the bottom, I've got my VMS volume on top of it. I deploy a virtual machine. These rectangles are empty because there's no data in them. I write data into the virtual machine, it writes it on VMFS, it writes it on the array, we're all good, right? I now delete some data inside the virtual machine, and what you can report on is that there's free space. Now technically, um, if this was, did not have unmapped, the data is still sitting there. But because now you have unmapped, now what the, the virtual machines are doing, or by default, is the operating system is passing an unmapped command down and saying, I actually really want to get rid of what's in the file system that's been marked as delete. So then you see the, 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 the issues, the unmapped commands get issued from the guest, VMS reduces in size, and then on the array, space is gone. So again, in the past, if I back up here, right, I think I have free space in the virtual disk, but on the array in VMFS it still resides. Now with unmap, it passes all the way through. To give you a different perspective on this, is this is a before and after within vSphere browser um, of what unmap looks like. On the left, you see a virtual disk that's 31 gigabytes in size. We updated the hypervisor to vSphere 6.5 with the settings enabled, and that drops down to 8. Point, is it 8.7? Right, 8.7, 8.8 gigabytes virtual disk. vSphere will actually shrink the size of the VMDK. So how does this matter, right? You know, I got a data reducing array. My all, all modern all flash arrays are, have data reduction inside them. Obviously, there's some variability that we talked about, but why would I care about unmap? Here's a customer that's running uh, with 6.25 terabytes of thin provision virtual, virtual machines, right? Whatever the thick provision size is, probably something like 12 or 11 terabytes, but they've done thin, so they're at 6.2. It's reduced in this example, right, to 1.25 terabytes. They're getting a nice 5 to 1 data reduction ratio. These are virtual servers, not desktops, right? Everybody be very happy about this. Then the customer upgraded and enabled uh, Unmap. What you see here in this, the reporting from the array is the blue bars are the actual use data and the purple bars is the snapshot data. As you see Unmap start to run over the course of about a day or two, you see a big shift between the blue bars, which is the active data, and the purple bars, which is snapshot. The array is holding on previous versions for recovery as you want a snapshot to do, but what you net in this customer example is you go from 1.25 per, uh, terabytes of data to 740 gigabytes. I think this example is 41 or 42 percent savings, and it goes from a 5.5 5 to 1 data reduction ratio to an 8.4, oops, that's a typo, 8.4 unreported to 1 data reduction ratio. I put unreported in there because we as storage vendors don't know how to, to track and accumulate what unmap means, because it's dynamic, it's everything that's kind of in flight. Bottom line, right, again, as I said, why pay for storage if you're holding on to data that nobody, you know, nobody wants? We talk about policies about moving, you know, in access data like in NAS and unstructured data sets to lower tiers, how much you get rid of it out of your structured data sets called virtual machines. So real quick, a couple tips here. Uh, when you're in Windows, right, Unmap is going to be supported for you natively in Windows uh, 2012, R2, 2016, 8 and 10. You can either do scheduled or automatic Unmap. Why pick one or the other? Um, I mean, uh, automatic or, I mean, there's some evidence out there that automatic can add a little bit of latency, but it's to like deletions. Um, if you're doing super high performance and you don't want even unmap commands to fill a slot in your queue depth, then maybe just do it on a schedule, yeah. right? Once again, that's probably a edge use case. Generally, automatic's gonna be fine, but that's probably the one situation I might do it manually instead yeah. of. And, and to be clear, by automatic, there's nothing for you to set. It's already the default behavior inside of, of these versions of Windows. You can schedule. So our default recommendation, recommendation under staying under simple, stick with automatic. I will say though with Windows, uh, yes it's supported with 6.0 ESX, it's probably not gonna work. There's some granularity issues which has been fixed in 6.5, so once again, I mean our, six basically five, this whole presentation. 6.5 U1. 6. Well, yeah, a patch one and then U1 again. Um, U1. Um, in the end, really our whole presentation is saying move to 6.5 and VMFS 6, I think is really what we're saying, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, yes. ideally, you know, again, if you're looking at new technology. Now, when you get into Linux, it's a little different, right? I can do it one of two ways. I can schedule, just like in Windows, I can schedule the unmap, right? And then I can just do an FS trim command with, with a cron job, nice and simple. Or I can do automatic unmap. But to do automatic, I've got to unmount and remount the volumes, which can mean application downtime, application offline. 
as well as a lot of work on your parts. And when you're running FS trim, I recommend running with the dash V for verbose. It'll tell you actually how much of that file system that it issued unmapped to. It's a yep. good metric to see. Yep. So my recommendation in this space, and this is a Vaughn recommendation that you know I see live on stage if Cody agrees with, I think you go with scheduled uh, in the Linux space because it's simpler to get set up on your deployed Linux VM fleet, right? I can literally just drop um, the configuration into the cron.d folder uh, on all my Linux hosts, and they're going to automatically pick up the schedule and start executing FS trim commands non-disruptively, right? I don't change production at all. I can schedule this with Puppet or whatever the scripting layer that I like to use and I move on. If you do automatic, remember, you know, that's probably better to jam in your templates for future deployments. Um, this is our tip. I think we already touched this patch one. So I don't yeah, yeah, there's, there's a fix in patch one, ESX 6.5 patch one that allows ESX to handle misaligned unmaps, which basically most of Microsoft's unmaps are misaligned, so they'll all fail. Um, so in 6.5 patch one and later, um, if they get a misaligned unmap, they just zero out the part of the virtual disk. If they get an aligned unmap, or a segment of that is al aligned, that will make it through and it'll shrink. The nice thing about that is that if you're using an AFA, pretty much every AFA has zero removal automatically, and so having it issue zeros to the dead space is identical to running unmap. The only difference is the VMDK won't shrink, but at least physically that, that, that all that space will be reclaimed. Yep. So being on patch one or, la or later is certainly important. Yep. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on here just because of, of time, and I try to elaborate on there a little bit too, mid, like, too long. Real quick, the question was, wait a minute, aren't thin virtual disks slow? Don't we write, write eager zero thick is the fastest and thin is the slowest? Um, that's no longer the case, and it's a combination of both looking at your storage, moving to all flash, but also enhancement that v VMware has put in place since 5.5 uh, through 6.5. Basically, uh, historically what happened when you used a thin virtual disk is if the virtual disk had to expand, vSphere had to pause the I.O., uh, allocate more space to the virtual disk, format it, and then continue the I.O. That's what the issue was. That still exists today, and it's a little more optimized, but what you need to realize today that most performance-sensitive applications, and again, I'll go back to common things, SQL, Oracle, other, you know, other structured databases, tend to pre-allocate their space inside the virtual disk. Right? They're already grabbing that space, so the I.O. overhead or, or lack that you're going to have is when you're first deploying um, and is only going to occur when you tell that database to go ahead and grab more space. So really what you're going to see is if you've got like an unstructured data set sitting in a thin virtual disk that's going to kind of grow on a per file basis, um, you know, ad, in an ad hoc fashion, that's really probably the only time that you're going to see this performance impact hit. So by and large, again, Start thin, get all the storage savings. If you have a performance issue, right click on it and change the format to thick. Because frankly, I mean, when you look at the difference between eGuard zero thick and thin, eGuard zero thick, right, zeroes it out at first. And with thin, it allocates the segment and then it zeroes it out and then this, the right can be committed. Uh, often the overhead penalty was sending those zeros, not even really expanding the VMDK. And uh, writing a zero on an AFA is l pretty much the cheapest thing you could possibly do, right? I mean, it's just like basically the AFA gets the zero and like, okay, great, and then just essentially discards it. Right, so the latency hit you get from that zeroing in thin on new writes is m greatly diminished. Right, so unless you have extremely performance sensitive apps, I would go with thin because then you get the in-guest on map. Otherwise, you're zero thick. But, but again, you know, know if your app pre-allocates or not. Yep. So <clears throat> one quick thing I want to talk about, there are a couple of VVOL sessions, so I'm not going to go into detail about VVOLs, but the one thing I do want to mention just kind of in relevance to, to AFAs, right? First off, what is VVOLs? Storage policy based controlled VM granular storage. So oh, you should be in marketing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> basically, you get an individual volume for every VMDK on the array. Right? There's a lot of other benefits, but you know, it takes take me six hours to go through all the cool stuff. But anyways, storage policy controlled VM granularity. Right? So the question here is that I have a lot of virtual disks going through what they refer to as a protocol endpoint. Right? When VVOLs are created, the array automatically creates them by request from VMware, and they all get bound as a sublun through a protocol endpoint. And so when you see that, you're like, isn't that a bottleneck, right? If I have possible, you can have 16,383 VVOLs bound to a single protocol endpoint. You might be saying, all right, I didn't have a bottleneck with VMFS, but this sounds like a performance bottleneck, right? Well, first off, um, how queuing works with protocol endpoints of VVOLs is no different than VMFS. There is a queue depth limit on your protocol endpoint, right? And all your VVOLs under that PE share that queue depth limit, right? So, the first thing, of course, about your AFA is understand how they manage their protocol endpoints. Once again, if they have a per volume queue depth limit on that PE, you might need more than one PE, 
right? Because that might be where your bottleneck is. Right? The important thing to note here is that the default queue depth limit for a protocol endpoint is 128. This can go the whole way up to 4096, right? Which, if you do the math with Little's law again, half millisecond latency, uh, that's 8 million IOPS per protocol endpoint per host, conceivably, right? At that point, you need more than one array, probably not more than one protocol endpoint, frankly. Um, so they have really opened it up from a protocol endpoint standpoint. There is a host-wide setting called PESNRO, Protocol Endpoint Schedule Number Request Outstanding, that dictates the default value for protocol endpoints, and you can change that. And you can also individually change it by changing the number of outstanding IOs per world for a PE. So VMware has really opened it up from a queuing perspective inside of virtual volumes. All right. So, inclusion. Thank you. Um, really, the, the long thing was VMFS 6, 6.5, a lot of really great enhancements from in-guest unmapped, scalability perspective, um, and just performance, right? Um, other than that, uh, we have about five minutes to take questions, and then we'll be outside, too, to take more questions. So, um, thank you. Yep. First off. Yeah, the other. Okay.